Yes, some stuff. <laughs> I'll tell you, technology. <laughs> but anyway, we want to thank the Lord. Okay, so we welcome to Christian Bible Chapel. We're here for our uh, Sunday school lesson, and we're praising and thanking God for all we have done. Let me adjust my camera a little bit here. Okay, we're in our lesson today. We're continuing our lesson in uh, Covenant Theology, as you see on the board. And uh, let's have prayer, then we're going to look at the meaning of Covenant Theology, okay? Father, we come thanking you for your, uh, your saving grace, and we're thanking you for uh, who you are, and thanking you for the privilege of coming before you in the blessed word of God. We thank you for our children's class earlier and we pray that it will be this, uh, acceptable on Facebook as well as YouTube as parents uh, deal with salvation to their children and about prayer. We pray that you guide us into understanding the teaching of your word. Let your spirit uh, Move us so that we can find some understanding of the scriptures. And we give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, coming of theology is a structure system whereby uh, God reveals himself to his people. I want to read something from uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, that, chapter 7. Let me read something. It says here, the distance between God and the creature is so great that all the reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward but by some voluntary condescent of on God's part, which he had pleased to express by the way of covenant. Now what that means, this was written back in 16-something um, by the Westminster uh, <coughs> ministers. They got together in England and they wrote this. And they documented because they want the church to have on record that God is creator. He is the creator of all creatures on earth. And we do, whether we're saved or not, owe him obedience because he is our creator. We cannot have any Protection or blessedness or reward coming from God because we are sinners. When Adam sinned, he knocked us out of the ballpark. I mean, he just took away any means of fellowship, relationship, and everything. And through his act of sin, it brought condemnation and judgment upon the whole human race. But God by means of his son, Jesus Christ, voluntarily condescend. In other words, he became a man. God the Son was incarnated. He became a man. That's what God the Son means, to be manifest in flesh. And he suffered a horrible death on the cross. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. And this is the covenant of redemption that we're talking about. We're going to look at the, the meaning of the word covenant of redemption. The requirements that the son had to do. And the results. Okay. Now last week we looked at election because it was one of the first order of salvation from Romans 8 28 to 30 that God first had to elect. See all this was done in the heart and the mind of God 
before Genesis 1-1, before there was anything, God planned and perfected salvation for man. Because, see, he, he, he mapped this all out, even the fall of man, the sinfulness of man, man's history, what is going on from Adam all the way up till he comes back, all has been mapped out and God knew all this was going to happen. It's called predestination and foreknowledge. God foreknew all this would happen from Adam, what happened to Adam all the way down to today, even past until the coming of Christ, even beyond that, because he is God. He is a sovereign God. Okay? And he knew this. So covenant theology out of the two systems that is dominating the Christian circle maintains that there are three covenants. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. The counterpart to that is called dispensationism, which deals with seven dispensations. Now, I know that whether you believe in covenant theology or dispensationism, that doesn't save you. Just like being a Calvinist or Baptist or Methodist, reform, that doesn't save you. Labels do not save you. I can express and say that I'm a Calvinist, I'm a reform, but that doesn't mean that because I am, I'm saved. You got a lot of people who say they are Calvinists, who are reformed, who are Baptist, Protestant, Catholic, that that doesn't mean that they're saved. Being saved is you have repented of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, whether you adapt to these labels, that's up to you. But far most, you become a Christian than more so than a Calvinist, Reformed, Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Unity, Christian Science, Seven Day of Venice, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, whatever those labels are, if you have not repented of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, those labels doesn't mean anything. So, but there's scripture proof that covenant theology is more substantiated than the other system, which is dispensationism, because there's no, no, there's no strong binding scripture for the seven dispensations, which we're supposed to be living in, the sixth dispensation of the church age in which God is calling out a people he through with Israel, and so he's calling out a people, but that doesn't make sense. Because Christ is Jew. And through Christ, both Jew and Gentile come to know Christ as Savior. There are different views within the realm of dispensationism. But there can only be one view as far as covenant theology because it is so scripture and mapped out. We can't understand the completeness of who God is and his salvation unless we understand that he made a covenant with man. And these covenants, covenant of redemption, covenant of works, and covenant of grace, was back in the foreknowledge, the eternal past with God. God knew this. Right. See, only in, if you have some understanding of covenant theology or of the reformed, teachings, do you get this? And you're, you get the teaching of predestination, sovereignty, and um, uh, being reformed. John Calvin wrote a book called uh, The Necessity of Reforming the Church, and it is definitely a necessity. You see, reformed theology takes you in to the structure of the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way through to Revelation 22 and it keeps you in the Bible wherein dispensationism is just a fragment of here and there scripture thrown piece and puzzle together to make a thought which 
dispensationalism itself did, it wasn't developed till the ninth, early 19th century, which was the late 18 such and such. But what is a covenant? A covenant is a pact or an agreement between two or more persons. Under the covenant of redemption, the agreement was between the father, God the Father and the Son, requiring the Son to make amends for sins for those whom the Father will give to the Son. Now we expressed this last in our last teaching. In Sunday school last week, you need to review the last week, all right? And we talked about how the requirements had to be made. These are the three and much more things that the son had to do to meet that agreement that he made before the father. Incidentally, um, in our Sunday school class for the teenagers, you notice if you go back and look at it on Facebook, we showed it about 9.30 this morning. It's, we reviewed the video on the Prince's Poison Cup by R.C. Sproul. You notice how the father came to the son and asked him to go to the city of wickedness to drink the cup of poison to redeem the people who he created who they turned away from him by the deceitfulness of sin and Satan. And you notice how that the son, it was important that the son go and drink from the pool the poison and he died. But the father raised him from the dead. Beautifully illustrated by R.C. Sproul. So you see the requirements for the covenant of redemption is that he had to assume a human nature. He had to become a man. The scripture tells us in Timothy, great is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3.16. Without any debate, without any arguments, God was manifest in the flesh. Now this was revealed in the Old Testament as well as in the New. Covenant agreement has been throughout the scriptures. God made a covenant with Adam. God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Israel. And lastly, he made a covenant with his son. This is the covenant of redemption, which involves all of mankind, involving those whom the father gives the son, that the son will come and die. So that's the second thing. He had to place himself under the law. The Son, when he, when, when God was manifest in the flesh, he placed himself under the law. The law cursed us. The law condemned us. Even though the law is good, the law is righteous, the law is holy. Paul says this in Romans chapter 7. Then Paul says, well, how could something that is holy, just, good, and righteous be all that bad? Well, because we as cursed sinful people ruined by sin couldn't keep God's law anymore. At first, Adam did keep until he disobeyed God. All the many times that he walked in fellowship with God, he was succumbed by his wife Eve to eat of the fruit. And when he ate, not when Eve ate, when Adam ate, he brought sin and condemnation upon the whole human race. Romans 5 and 12, wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death by one man, Adam. So the son had to place himself under the law because the wages of sin, if you break the law, you have to die. That was the point. You broke the Sabbath, you had to die. You broke the law, you was judged. You was judged by the law. Right. The hideous crime of sin demands death. By placing himself under the law, he had to die. And that brings us to the third one. He had to 
propitiates sins by bearing, by, by becoming the sacrifice, by bearing our sins. Isaiah 53, remember that? The word propitiate here, according to the text, as in 1 John 2 and 2, it means sacrifice. But here in Romans 3, 23, 24, the word propitiate, whom God set forth to be a propitiation for our sins, that that particular text, and that word in that text, means to avert the wrath of God, to be held responsible that the judgment of God was placed on him. And that's why by becoming a sacrifice for sin. See, there was a need. See, God was sovereign. Oh, God, he, he knows what he's doing. In the Old Testament, God demanded a sacrifice when, you, when the children of Israel sinned. When the children of Israel sinned, they had to bring a dove, a pigeon, if they were poor, they didn't have enough to bring a heifer, a ram, or a bullock, or a, a lamb. They had to bring meal offering, some kind of offering. But you had to bring an offering and offer it before God by means of the priest. All right? And the priest will offer that sacrifice in your behalf before God. And he did this daily. The priest worked every day offering sacrifices because people kept sinning. And they will sin and they will come and offer a sacrifice. The priest will offer it before God. Once a year, the high priest was to go into the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And this was done on the Day of Atonement. Jesus became both priest and high priest. See, the law was a shadow of the things to come. And the things that was to come was Jesus Christ, the ultimate last sacrifice. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Every priest that daily stands and continues to offer a sacrifice which could never take away sin. Mainly he's talking to the, the system that, that was being developed at that time as now going on today, which we call Roman Catholicism because the priest is still saying Mass. And some Episcopals and uh, churches and some Lutheran, they still give him Mass. And this is wrong. This is an abomination because it strikes down the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Once and for all, he gave his life. There can be no more sacrifice for sins. There can be no more atoning for sins. No more sacrifice. You see, Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 proves that the dispensationist who believes in the seventh dispensation of the kingdom age, you can't have no more sacrifices, which during the seventh dispensation, I have a chart here. It's not the best of charts here, but, and I don't think some of you are going to be able to see it because it's so long, the seven dispensations. And on the seventh dispensation here, I put it up here, it shows the kingdom age in which is called the millennium, in which Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom and, um, and his earthly rule and all the, the uh, Old Testament sacrifices and everything is resumed again, start over again. But how can that be when Christ is there? Why do that? Why have a sacrifice? Even if it says, well, it's just for memorial. But there cannot be any more sacrifices. Because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. We have, right now, the dispensation is called the dispensation of the grace. There's always been grace. Even back under human government, the third dispensation, it says human government, the dispensation of human government. That's when God shows grace to Noah and man 
fails God. Matter of fact, in each dispensation, God, man fails God. In each one, man just totally fails God. But through Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The ultimate sacrifice, the last sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. So you see the, the, the well, the fallenness or the, uh, the unsureness of scripture, dispensation of innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, church, age, or grace, and the kingdom age. We cannot break up scripture and force it because of what uh, wise men or able men with understanding try to piece it together and say, well, it's the dispensation. And you may be a Christian and follow that system, but it doesn't make it right. But then people will say, well, what makes covenant theology right because it's so interweaved into the scripture it's structured into the scripture there's no frailty there's no puzzlement there's no breakage as we just showed you in the various um, dispensations and all of them really okay. but in any case the covenant of redemption which is the first covenant that God made and this covenant was made back in the eternal past between the Father and the Son. As I said, he had to assume a human nature. Right? Yet without sin now. Peter tells us that. Okay? He, was, he had to place himself under the law. He was born, Galatians chapter what, 3 and 4 tells us, he was born of a woman made under the law. He, Jesus lived during the time of the law. And the law demands that if you break God's commandments, you have to die to death. The scripture tells us, curse is everyone that hangs on the tree. Jesus, not that he broke the law. He didn't break the law. He was perfect, sinless. He was God in flesh. But because he took upon us, took upon himself our sins, he became a curse. And being become a curse, he had to die. And that's what the word propitiate means, that his death averted the wrath of God. So when a person received Christ as Savior, they will never, ever, ever, ever face the ultimate wrath of God by means of the second death or the lake of fire. Scripture tells us in Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No judgment. That's the wrath. No believer will die the death of death, which is the second death, because you will not ever perish. I give unto them eternal life, and they will never perish. And perish means, as in John 10, 28, John 3, 16, 2 Peter 3 and 9, it's not the Lord's will that any should perish. Each one of those, and many other scriptures, the word perish means to die the, the horrible death of the second death, never to come back anymore. No resurrection. All right, now, so Jesus, those are his requirements, and he met those requirements. Now, had he been born into the world by means like we are through Adam and Eve getting together, I mean, excuse me, Joseph and Mary got together and produced the baby Jesus, he could not have been the Savior because the Savior had to 
not be tainted or touched by sin. Jesus was holy, blameless, sinless, undefiled. Now, last week, we talked about one of the results, and we looked at the first one. Let me get my paper here. All right. We talked about the first one, which is election. It's nine of them. It's nine. It says, one, election, two, calling. Now, let's look at, let's look at the second one, the calling. Now, even though from eternal past, God the Father made this covenant of redemption with the Son, and this was done way before Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, in the eternal past, this happened. He still had to, in his plan, God's plan, he still has to call, he has to draw. And this takes us back to the calling, takes us back to um, John. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. And John chapter 3. In a sense, number 2 and 3, which is calling and regeneration, we want to sort of put those together. Right? The calling and regeneration. Right? What the calling is, Okay. Now, remember our, our theme text in order of salvation, ordo salute, is that's Latin for order of salvation. Remember in Romans, let me get it real quick. I know I told you to turn to Romans, uh, John 6, but keep your finger right there while I read Romans chapter uh, 8, 28. For we know, we know that all things work together for good to whom to them that love God, to them that are the called, yeah, the call, according to his purpose. God's purpose is to call out a select few within the realm of mankind. He has chosen them, like election, ek lego, that's the Greek word, chosen, called, ek lego. He called, many are called, few are chosen. He called, he elects, he called. And within the realm of calling, he draws through the power of the Holy Spirit. So from, from Adam to the last person that makes up the church, the body of Christ, the elect, when that last person repents of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, the second coming will take place. We don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen, but when that last person, whatever generation it's going to be, it could be this one, it could be the next one, it could be whenever, that's when Jesus Christ is going to come. No signs, no thunderbolts, no, no clouds making... It, you know, and all that kind of stuff. No World War Three. No, no killings. Getting on a rampage. Everybody poisoned and stuff. All, see, signs that we see in past generation, this generation, even in the time of Jesus, does not point to the second coming of Christ. See, you have to understand Matthew's chapter twenty-four to understand the statement I just made. Okay? Because people in Jesus' days as well as today, they're looking for signs and wonders and miracles. Jesus says the evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. Stop looking for signs. Stop looking for signs. And that's just, oh, Jesus is coming. Oh, that proves Jesus. Is, no, the scriptures prove that Jesus is coming. There are no signs. It, the scriptures already said that Christ is coming back. Just like the scripture says he's coming the first time, scripture says he's coming the second time. All right. 
In our text, it says in Romans 8, 28, at the end, to them who are the call. So God called certain individuals to him. And then what he does is that he draws them through the power of the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose? The drawing connects with the call. The call connects to the election. See, each one of these in the order of salvation they must be binding, they must be together. Because if you break any one of these, just like on Wednesday night Bible class, we talked about the tulip. That is one flower, if you take away one petal from that tulip bulb, it messes up the whole tulip, it dies. So it is with the order of salvation. God called, and this calling is twofold. It was a calling, election in the predestinated mind of God as well as when I got saved at that particular day, hour, year, whatever. When God called you to receive Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Here it is in John chapter 6 verse 37. All that the Father gives me, see that's part of the calling in which the Spirit of God draws you. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, Scripture says, I will in no wise cast out. Okay. Let's look at verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me Draw him. See that? That's in verse 44. John 6, 44. Now let's look at that. Because verse 44 is going to take you to John chapter 3. Now let's go to John chapter 3. All right. This is the new birth chapter. The regeneration birth chapter. As in Ezekiel 36, 26, and Titus 3 and 5. Ezekiel 36, 26, mark that down, with Titus 3 and 5. All these three scriptures, Ezekiel 36, 26, John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5, Titus 3 and 5, speaks of this new birth. Now, it's, it's, it's other passages, but I, I'm just going to use these three, okay? Now, in John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man, a person, be born again, he or she cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Except the man, you notice the word except is used in verse 3 and in verse 5. The word except means unless. It is the, the Greek English word unless. And what that word means is necessary condition. There must be a necessary condition. And, 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 and that necessary condition is that God has to draw you. After he has elected you and called you, he draws you to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. But that, it doesn't stop there. He drawing you to that track, to that person, to that church, to that preaching of that word. It doesn't stop there. It picks up. That's why Jesus says, Except the man is born again. See, that's the that's the the key there. Born again. The the the, the phrase itself, born again, is regeneration, renewing of the mind. It is the I, I like it how R. C. Sproul says it. He says it is the initial part of salvation, being saved. It is, the, it is the ultimate power of God coming into your life, 
changing your heart, which is deceitful and desperately wicked, evil. Changing your mind, which is dull, ignorant to the things of God, do not want God. That's what born again means. Right? That's what born again means. See, let's not argue about it, but let's not be confused about it at the same point. See, born again in, in, in human language is a process wherein God changes our input about him. And the only way he can do that is to change your heart and your mind. Because right now your heart is deceitful. A person's heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. It's evil. It's wicked. It's carnal. It's flesh. It thinks only of self. It's greed. It's, 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 it's evil. With a heart comes these fruits and manifestation of lies, adultery, fornication. See, with the heart, it's not what goes in, it's what comes out. This is what Jesus taught. So it's the heart that needs to be changed in man. And that process, you can't do it by baptism, mass, speaking in tongues, joining the church, doing good deeds, helping people, being nice, giving offerings, Tides, charitable things to people, helping the homeless, helping the poor, helping nations, helping that all in itself morally is okay and acceptable in moral instinct and it's okay. But for salvation, it's a no-no. Born again. It's a regeneration. It's a changing. It's a transformation. You're born again. But you see, born again is not the completeness of being saved because you still have to repent and believe the gospel. But you see, now be mindful now. Be careful because I don't want you to be tagging me on Facebook or whatever. No, no, no. Being born again is being saved. Listen to what the scripture teaches. Not what I say. But what the scripture teaches, born again is the supernatural power wherein the Spirit of God, according to Titus 3 and 5, here in our text, John 3, 3, 3, 5, and in Ezekiel 36, 26, is when the power of God cleanses and changes your disposition of your mind and your heart. Because as it is right now, you're not able to come to God. You don't want to come to God. Your heart is wicked. You're evil. You're sinful. You're morally, spiritually corrupt. And you're thinking in your feelings towards God. All right? that's, that's what born again. That's the necessity of being born again. Once he changes your heart and makes it a heart of flesh and gives you light in your mind, changes your mind, you are able to receive the seed which is the word of God. And once the seed is planted into you, You open up to God through repentance and faith. Then and only then are you completely saved. I know, I know. Okay, well, but this is this is what see this is the reason why a lot of people are not truly saved. Because either they made a decision or they accept Christ as Savior, they're doing some kind of works of emotion of, of the, or the movement of the flesh, of the mind, instead of letting God save them alone. 
And, 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 and the horrible thing about this, a person can go on till the end of life thinking that they are saved and really are not because they have experienced some emotional breakdown or some feeling or sign or wonder or sinner's prayer or went to the altar. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to know that people leave this planet by means of death. They die. And ultimately they will face the wrath of God and anger of God. The furious wrath of God at judgment day. Because they, did, they, they didn't recognize truly from their heart and their mind about sin, about judgment, about repentance. And this is, this is so stated in John chapter 16. When he, the spirit of come, when he, is, when he comes, he will reprove men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And that's why it's up to the preacher, the, the person that presents the gospel, get it right so that person can be genuinely saved. So that's calling and regeneration. But number four, you look at number four here, it is conversion. So it's election, calling, regeneration, Conversion. What is conversion? Well, the word is, it means itself. You, you're converted. You change. You're transformed. You do about face in your life. Conversion. That's a transformation from one life to a different life. You live. If any person be in Christ. They're a new person now. That's what conversion is. Your life has changed. Your life has changed. You're not perfect. You're not sinless. You, we still make mistakes because we're in this cursed body. We, this body. I mean, you know. And but the point is, as First John uh, two tells us, that if any man do sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Yeah. And John says it's not only for you, but for all those whom the Father propitiates, the Father saves, redeemed, called out, elects. That's what that is. See, that verse there in 1 John 2, 2, when he says he's a propitiation not only for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. See, that throws people off too, because a lot of people be thinking, well, Jesus died for everybody. That scripture doesn't mean that. Again, the word world there doesn't mean universal with every human being. It's the same word world in John 3.16. 2 Corinthians 5, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the whole the world unto himself. That word world in 2 Corinthians 5 is not talking about everybody. See, we, we forget what scriptures is teaching and we go by denominational teaching or tradition. It's so engraved in church that we all believe, even I myself, that God must love everyone because he sent his son to die for everyone for God so loved the world everybody that he, came, he gave his only begotten son but what breaks that down is it says that whosoever see it doesn't make sense because of the word whosoever if, if, if it's so universal if Christ died for everyone if the word world means every human being that little word whosoever see it breaks down that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. what's the point of John saying whosoever believes in him shall not perish well then that means 
some people are going to be perished. It's going to die and spend eternity under the umbrella of second death. So that means that he couldn't have died for everybody. Because how would it be that at the judgment day, a person stands up there and says, well, Je well, Jesus, you you died for me. You, you can't send me to the lake. You can't give me the second death. No, because you died for me. And I think a lot of people have left this planet thinking that. Wow. And that's food for thought there. <laughs> A lot of pre it's a wake-up call for a lot of preachers to get the gospel right. they got to get the gospel right. All right. So, we are elected, we are called, we are regenerated, we are converted. Okay. Number five, justification. All right. That one, it, it's, it's very lengthy because the word, I know people use the phrase, just as if you never sinned. It's catchy, ain't it? But that's not the meaning to it. Man, no, that's not the meaning to it. That's the easy way of defining justified or justification, whichever. It's the root word is justified. The word number five, justification, or to be justified, means this. To be declared righteous to be declared righteous so when a person has been re thoroughly regenerated by the washing and the renewing of the Holy Spirit Titus 3 and 5 by the word and the Spirit of God John 3 verse 3 and 5 That means that they are that, that at that point they are declared from Almighty God, God the Father, that they are righteous. You are righteous even as Jesus is righteous. And that's scripture. You're declared righteous. Still in this body of flesh. You're declared by God righteous. And you will never face the wrath of God, the judgment of God for your sin. Because he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Then the scripture says, Peter used this, the passage of scripture. He says, and with his stripes we are healed. The word heal there is deliverance, a spiritual deliverance, salvation. Not healing that because you're saved, your body, all you got to do is call on Jesus and he heals you. Because a lot of Christians, and most, some of the most dedicated and strong Christians are those that have been sick all their life. And some are still sick, and there's some pain and sickness that still affect a Christian body, and it, and it won't leave. As Paul says three times, I sought the Lord that Paul wanted to be delivered from his ailment, but the scripture says, my grace is sufficient. Leave it alone, Paul. Go on, do what I tell you to do. And at times, sometimes we need to do that. Those knees given out on us, the legs, the arms, the eyesight, our body, our flesh, our bones. See, as a Christian, we're not immune to cancer. We're not immune to a virus or sickness of any kind. Yet Christians believe in that because you're a Christian, you don't get sick, you don't get pain, you don't have problems, you don't have trials and tribulations. You always got to have money, prosperity, health, wealth, you know, sound like Benjamin Franklin, huh? Penny a day keeps the doctor away or the apple or whatever the case. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. You no, know, a Christian will suffer. A Christian will have pains. That's part of the plan of God for us to suffer for Jesus' sake. In whatever manner, all of us, in various degrees, in various areas in our lives, we're stricken, smitten, 
painful chastened by God in the point of suffering for the sake to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. But justified means to be declared righteous. Now, the passage of scripture for that in Romans chapter 3 through chapter 5 talks about uh, justification. Let's look at it. In Romans chapter 3, let's look at verse 20. Romans 3 and 20. It says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the law cannot save you, but the law has its part in salvation. It doesn't save you. It brings you to the cross. Galatians. You're going to see in Romans again, it's going to say, for what the law could not do, do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law is not weak. The law is good. The law is righteous. The law is holy. But working through us, oh, it takes a second seat. Because we are cursed. We are because the weakness of the flesh, Paul says. So that you may not think that I'm quoting from Charlotte's book. It says here in Romans uh, 8. It says in Romans 8 and 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Every believer in Christ is capable of fulfilling the righteousness of the law but only because we're in Christ. There's nothing about us. And, and let me mark this. Note this. It's nothing that God looked down the corridors of time and saw me and said, well, you know, I know Sherman is going to get saved, so let me put him in the book of life. No, God didn't, he doesn't see anything in you and I. There's nothing righteous that God sees in any of us. It's not that he looked down the corridors of history and saw you and you and you and you and say, I'll save this person, I'll save that person, I'll save this person. Oh yeah, let me save this family and this home and this person. No, he didn't do that. Through his sovereign will and plan, God chooses those throughout eternal uh, throughout mankind history, those whom he want to spend eternity with him. It's called predestination. And then the scripture says, those he did not choose, he passed by. That's in Romans chapter 9. Read it. It's a hard and difficult chapter, I agree. It's so hard and difficult of a chapter that it's so that the human mind and flesh ignores it and can't accept it, just like many cannot accept John 3, 16. But because of the teachings within the church that is so engraved that God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, He died on the cross for you, why don't you get saved? Oh, God has a plan for your life. He wants you to get, oh, God... See, this is wrong. No, we must never, when speaking about the gospel and telling people about salvation, we must never tell people first that God loves them. Because you don't know the mind and the consciousness and the heart of that person. They could reject the gospel message and they'll fly it up at you or at the judgment before God. There's no reason. There's no, it, they won't get away with it, but, but they'll try. And Jesus far knew people would stand before him at the marriage feast, at the wedding, 
at the end of time and say, when was we, we saw you hungry and we didn't feed you, or we saw you sick and we didn't, or we saw you in prison and we didn't visit you? you someone will be, have the audacity to say, well, I got my own wedding garment on. I want to wear uh, black and green to the wedding. And the bridesmaid and the bridegroom already said that everybody is to wear purple velvet dress or perfect velvet, you know, tuxedo. And you come in there with a black and a green suit or black and green clothes on you. They say, wait a minute, who, who are you? How dare you come to my wedding like that? Bind him, bind her, and hand and foot, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gashing of teeth. So it does matter how we get the gospel right and portray it and talk of it to lost people as it was told to us. And that's how we receive Christ. Through the election, through the calling of God himself, through the power of the Holy Spirit regeneration, which causes us to be converted. And therefore, the results of that is we are declared righteous. Okay. Let's look at adoption. Number six. Number six. Well, I don't think we did. We finished justification. I don't think we finished justification. That's before we go into adoption. We might have to say that for next time, but I, I want to look at more on justification. I don't want to run through that because it's a whole teaching on justification, but back to Romans chapter 3, I said verse 20, and then we look at verse 24. There it is, Romans 3, 24. Therefore, having been, you see the word being in your King James in the Greek is having been declared righteous because of what you have went through as far as the election, the calling, regeneration, and conversion, you're declared righteous. See, justification cannot happen until you are called, drawn, convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, regeneration, you're converted then you're justified. Having been justified freely. Now, I, I, I have to emphasize this, and I'm sorry, but I have to emphasize this. It's not by an infusion, as our Roman Catholic friends believe in, because according to the Council of Trent, under the Roman Catholic system, anyone that rejects the, the, the teaching of the church, that's the Roman Catholic Church, that you are justified by the infusion of grace, the infusion, and it goes on. Let them be anathema. That's why they wanted to get rid of Martin Luther, John Huss, and the rest of the guys because they say, no, no, no. See, all these guys were Catholics. All of them. See, there wasn't nothing but one system back then. It was Catholic. And he was commanded to go to church. And you had to obey what the priest said. You had to take the mass. You had to go. And see, that was, that was, there was no Baptist. There was no Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, and all of that. You know, it wasn't an all denomination. It was just one system out there. And it was Roman Catholic Catholicism. So when these guys broke away, Thomas Kramer, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and the rest of them, and, and John Huss, and all of them, you know, and, and John Wycliffe, and all of them, when they just broke away and said, no, this is not right. This is not what the scripture teaches. The Spirit of God moved upon these men and said, hey, look, this is wrong. Let's, pro let's produce the Bible in an English form, in a, in, a, in a Swedish form, in a German form, so people won't be deceived because the known language, the Bible, the, the Vulgate, the Rome Bible, the Vulgate was in Latin, and the only one that knew anything was the priest, and he was getting it wrong.
So justification is not an infusion, it's not baptism, it's not baptism of any kind, any mode, M-O-D-E. It's not joining the church, aligning itself with a system, with a religion. Okay? It's being, it's, it's, it's declared righteous. Okay? Let me read that before we close being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Hmm. Wow. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteous, that he might be just and justifier of him which believe in Jesus Christ. Where is boast in them? It is included. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And we're going to stop right there because the thing is it, no matter what church you're affiliated in, and if they involve any acts of works, whether it's the law as far as the Ten Commandments or any other type of law. What is the law? The law is a work of some sort that we attempt to do and trust them in order to be saved. A lot of people trust that because they got circumcised, keep the Ten Commandments, keep the Sabbath, tithe, give their offering, get baptized, take the mass, pray to the priest, pray to Mary, taking gift for indulgence. And the list goes on and on. Scratch their back, quit their back, see a vision, see a dream do good deeds the list goes on all that is works of righteousness under the law see when we see the word law it doesn't all the time in Romans mean Ten Commandments it's, it, it's beyond that it's more than that and a lot of people are obeying some type form of law works of righteousness to obtain salvation, wherein you cannot do that. That's the plain facts of what the scripture teaches. Okay, Lord's willing, week after next, I'll be working next Sunday, so week after next, as we gather again, we're going to look at number six, adoption, and then we're going to look at sanctification. Now all this is the aftermath, justification, adoption, Sanctification is the aftermath of conversion, regeneration. Because you can't, you can't be justified, adopted, or even be sanctified unless you first are regenerated and converted. And I know there's some means to the word sanctify, the three process or the three stages of it. We'll get to that. We'll, We'll get some understanding of that, okay? All right, we thank and praise God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God, and we thank you for the, your, your truths. May our hearts be so enlightening in knowing about the covenant of redemption. But it didn't stop there. You gave us the covenant of works. And during that covenant of works, it shows us that we are so sinful Wow, it shows us that we're sinful. And that's why it's called the covenant of works. Then you gave us the covenant of grace. And without all three are binding together, because without either one, Lord have mercy upon us. We thank you for your covenant that you made towards man. It's so binding in scripture. And we thank you, Father. Now, we pray that the Holy Spirit of God will continue to give us guidance in the, the ministering of the Word of God as we move on to our worship service. Uh, 
11.30 and then our 5.30 service. May you bless us, our hearts, all of our hearts, in the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. All right. We'll be back at 11.30 for our uh, worship service. Okay. Where are we? Not even take.